Hello and welcome to this Asia Scotland Institute webcast. My name is Doug Cook. Today, we're very fortunate to have two highly qualified speakers to discuss strategic issues of maritime security in our global sea lines of communication in the context of the current coronavirus pandemic and its implications for the merchant navy, maritime forces and maritime training. To start, we welcome Vice Admiral Clive Johnston, recently retired from the Royal Navy, having been Commander, Allied Maritime Command, the Central Command of all NATO Maritime Forces, and as such, he was the primary maritime advisor to the Alliance. He is now a strategic consultant, advising various businesses and organisations. We will also be joined by Paul Little, Principal and Chief Executive of Glasgow City College. The college is the largest further and higher education and technical institution in Scotland, offering 2,000 professional and technical courses annually from access level to masters to over 40,000 students. Among its faculties and of particular interest in our discussion today is the Faculty of Nautical and STEM, which offers a full range of maritime operations courses and training for our Merchant Navy in conjunction with partner organisations. Paul, in addition to his significant experience in further education, was previously an officer with Her Majesty's Coast Guard and is a fellow of the Nautical Institute, so extremely well qualified to discuss these issues with us today. The Asia Scotland Institute Chairman and Founder Roddy Gow will be putting the questions to our speakers and so without further ado I will hand over to him. So Clive I wondered if um, you could start off by telling us how you read the, uh, the current situation. Roddy thank you and it's a great honour to be in, in this body. I think it's really essential that as we try to feel our way forward that there's a broad policy of people trying to understand what's going on. I'm fairly clear in my head that um, we're going to go through a two-part understanding of this crisis and, it, and its impact on the, on the global commons. I think we're seeing now the emotional component of it, um, and by that I mean that component that is caused by vulnerability and reaction and our government's reaction to it. Um, and I think that is where you get quite a lot of spurious reporting and quite a lot of dislocation. What will happen with time is we will then reflect on what we see and then there will be a policy led uh, analysis of this. And that's critical because I think that policy led component will be um, uh, will be linked to the money. And I think that's probably in about a year's time we will see real clarity of what's happened as a result of COVID-19, and we're certainly not seeing that now. I think, however, it is very important that we understand that COVID-19 sits amongst a series of other very major challenges, um, which uh, makes this time unique and so interesting, but also so demanding for politicians and policymakers. I think at the top of my worry list is uh, the global, global endeavour to address the climate uh, challenge, which I think is the number one priority, which should be the number one priority for all nations and the world. Um, and, and it's that because not only of what we're doing to the planet, but it's driver on global instability that will swamp us if we don't address it now, or we're probably too late already. The second context piece I think we need to have is that around great power competition. Um, I could draw three or four other threads here, but I think there's two. We need to, as the West, understand our relationship with China uh, and our relationship both with China trade, but our relationship with China security. And it's much more than the South China Seas. Uh, and, and we, the West, we, Europe, in our muddled response to the COVID crisis, have highlighted very clearly we don't have that yet. I think the other thing uh, in, in great power competition is we need to understand what we want to do and the relationship we want to have with Russia. I think that's important because I think that 
uh, we could drive ourselves into a position that makes Russia a greater and a greater enemy, or we could have a slightly more sophisticated approach and identify where we might want to work together. And I think in a world that's in crisis, that would be my chosen path. <clears throat> I think the, th the third major tranche I would suggest that we need to consider and will shape the world into the future is the failure or the perce perception of impotence of many of our global or regional organizations. You know, I say this with sadness and as an element of discomfort, but I don't think the United Nations or the World Health Organization come out of this comfortably. And if they're Western liberal structured organizations, then that doesn't paint well for the West. And I think they can be challenged and I think that's fair. I also think that the EU, in its inability to have a common EU approach for the first third, if not first half of this crisis to date, um, I think um, may confirms the naysayers view that Europe will never be able to relax, react as a body to European security. And I think that's dangerous, even though UK is leaving Europe, a strong Europe is very important. And, and I think it paints NATO, and I'm a deep, passionate sponsor of NATO and supporter, but it paints NATO in a light that perhaps put, puts uh, my era's debates around containment and deterrence into the spotlight. And so I hope out of this comes a more sophisticated conversation about deterrence and containment, um, uh, but I'm not sure we can do that at the moment. And finally, there is, of course, Brexit. Brexit now looks uh, a better idea than perhaps it did a, a year ago with all the passion running, but we haven't understood yet how it is going to change our strategic focus and our horizon and our influence. And I think UK, uh, that will be very important. And I think Europe, that's important because we are a thought leader in Europe. And if we get cut out, um, uh, then I think a major engine room of common sense and intelligence and other things will get cut out of the European, European position. So I think it's bad for both parts, or we have to consider it for both parts. And I'll round out with, um, you know, uh, uh, the thought that I think it is a defining moment for our society of our time, our global society. And what will be interesting is the 2030s will be determined by the funding decisions that all of our governments will make uh, in the next 12 months, because they will have to be significant um, if we are to get some form of economic recovery. So, so both in my military hat and in my strategy hat and in my commercial hat, I'm trying to understand how the 2030s might be shaped now. And I think it's worth considering it with that longevity, because I think that's what's going to happen. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Clive, for your thoughts. And I want to also welcome now Paul Little, the principal of the City College of Glasgow, Glasgow City College, uh, where, as you know, um, not only does he have a merchant marine background, but there is the leading um, centre for the training of those who would enter the merchant marine in, in the United Kingdom, if not globally. And that's a good point, I hope you'd agree, Paul, for me to ask Clive about Given that most of the food stuff that arrives in the United Kingdom arrives by sea, keeping the maritime routes open um, and dealing with the security aspects in a time of increasing tension, as you have mentioned with China and with Russia, um, what's our capability of doing that? And how important is it to encourage young men and women through Glasgow City College, for example, to, to get involved in that aspect of the services? So, so I, I'm at the moment not terribly worried about the logist of the global logistics flow line at sea um, in, on top of the waves. I think that there is so much uh, requirement for global trade at the moment that everybody, uh, the Russians, the Chinese, the West, Europe, however you want to uh, cut and dice, will keep uh, supply chains open and won't threaten them. So, so in terms of shipping trade routes, I think they're reasonably safe. I think we'll have to think quite seriously about hubs and spokes. I think we have seen in China during the COVID crisis, and we're seeing now in Western Europe and the rest of the world, ports uh, having to be very nimble in how they keep open and keep, uh, keep the supply line from, um, from the fairly boy 
into warehouses. That is proving to be problematic. I don't think we've ever thought of that before. And we need to look for industries and ideas to make that simpler and perhaps more automated, perhaps more digitized um, and more flexible. I think the one area that we could touch on is the security of those oil and gas pipelines, but most notably the digital communications uh, cables that sit through all the choke points and across the oceans. And I think there is a real concern about that that we need to address um, because while this is a pandemic and it has affected the world globally and therefore tensions are low, a cyber attack on a region would have elicited a very different set of responses. And, and I think we need to be wary of that and apply the lessons we learn from this pandemic to cyber and other issues, because I think they will be pressing. My, my, the, 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 the question you ask me about shipping and value and everything like that, I think shipping is changing perhaps in the most exciting way I've seen in my lifetime. Uh, I'm involved in lots of businesses where we are focusing on the green energy component of the maritime trade picture. We're focusing on new hull forms, new structures, new delivery vehicles, uh, the use of AI and manned ships, uh, and a range of other capabilities. And so uh, rather than being, if, um, if you like, the sort of cart horse of industries falling second place in glamour to the airline industry, I think that's reversing. I think shipping will become the glamorous element of future global trade. And I think there is also a very glamorous element in understanding how we take traffic off the roads and other pieces of infrastructure and short hop ferries, short hop mobility at sea uh, may be enabled by better navigation, better charting, better bathymetry, better you know, a whole range of things starts to open up some very, very exciting possibilities. So, so um, would I consider going back and being a mariner again? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the moment to be a mariner, quite frankly. Good. Paul, um, having heard Clive making those remarks, um, are you happy to, to comment, switch off your mic and come on in? Yeah, thank you very much, um, Roddy. Um, and uh, nice to meet you, Clive, online. I um, want to echo some of those points and maybe even um pick up uh, a very pertinent point in that we, we often talk about this crisis in terms of war analogies uh, the invisible enemy etc and, and i just want to remind everyone that during particularly the first world war uh, the lifeline remained firm thanks to the merchant navy and i think the lifeblood of global trade depends on merchant shipping and the merchant navy and obviously it's all part of the overall naval family but i think um the merchant navy has endured many different challenges in its time and and this is yet another challenge that it's faced and you know as an old self myself i keep thinking worse things happen at sea so you know we will get through this uh, as an industry uh, and parts of it will be challenges right now. I, I think on a coastal basis, our ferries are quite strained. They're doing a sterling job in supplying our lifeline communities and, and the islands. Uh, I think they, they're not making very much money because they're not carrying many passengers. They're keeping them all supplied. I think our cruise industry and leisure industry have been devastated by this. And, and that will be my biggest challenge. Some will bounce back. Some won't. I think that's the parallel to that. As Clive has mentioned, is kind of the aviation industry. Some uh, aviation companies will bounce back and some won't. Um, I think the deep merchant fleet will endure in this uh, crisis. Um, I think obviously you have to look to, you know, the concept of, you know, the cost of fuel. And, and obviously that's quite low at this stage. You know, it's kind of minus forty dollars in a barrel at one stage and uh, parallel to that you've also got to look at the staffing on those ships uh, they'll be like you and me and clive they'll be anxious about um the crisis and they'll be anxious either to be repatriated or they'll be anxious to do their job and many of them will do their job in that uh, and they've 
you know, they're part of a, a long, proud naval tradition, particularly in the Merchant Navy, of doing their job and carrying on regardless of that. Certainly, we don't see any signs of uh, a reduction in the number of cadets stepping forward. As we speak and have this interview, I have 247 young men and women, navigation officers, engineering officers, all around the world, um, keeping ports and countries, and particularly the UK supplied. And not one of those has wanted to come back home at this stage. So a bit of a uh, early reflections about the importance of uh, the merchant, mercantile marine and, and the merchant navy in particular, but also maybe centering a little bit on the individuals that actually have to endure this and endure this in heightened anxiety. If you're in deep ocean, uh, you will be fearful of your family at home but you'll also be fearful when you come into port. The last thing you might want is somebody coming on your ship and bringing this virus on that ship. So we shouldn't uh, uh, ignore that. And we shouldn't ignore, for example, the, the mental strain that um, seafarers are having just now or indeed some of the hardship that's gone. So in many ways, um, I think just right now, uh, we are going through what I consider to be a storm. Um, I'll use that analogy rather than the war analogy. Uh, and I think some ships are hove to in this storm. And, and the way I've described this actually just recently uh, to my senior management team is that I see this present period as, as going into the dark night. And if you're a ship shape and you're trained and you're ready uh, and you're stoic and stalwart, as I believe many are in this industry, then you know that you will come out of that dark night and your hope is that you'll come out of that dark night into calmer waters in the morning. And, you know, the mariners will be wearing their PPE, the mariners will be accepting the situation, but the mariners will also be focused on keeping us supplied and, and the professionalism of us. We can't undermine, or in, sorry, underestimate the professionalism of our, our merchant navy. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Could you give uh, give Clive and the others of us on the call just an idea of the the size of this of the of this of the school of the college um, and where this fits within that? Yeah. So uh, the City of Glasgow College has got a faculty of nautical science, and it's in effect uh, a naval school. So I can see why you use that word school, and in that. Naval School at Merchant Navy School, um, although we do work with the Royal Navy and the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. We have, in any one year, about 2,000 ratings and cadet officers, engineering science, uh, um, and marine engineering and electrical technical officers, and, and obviously the ratings associated with that, studying with us. And they come from all around the world. And there are 230 naval colleges in the world and in my estimation, the City of Glasgow College is amongst the top 10. It's the largest one in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's the most modern. There's been a 70 million pound investment in 2015 to create a new naval school, the previous school, which itself was a modern building opened by Earl Mount Batten in 69, was demolished in a, a state-of-the-art uh, campus with the state-of-the-art uh, simulation technology. Uh, and a whole range of navigation technologies and engineering technologies w was actually installed in its place. So it, it stands proudly beside the banks of the mighty River Clyde uh, and it's world renowned, uh, but it's also um, a very busy institute. And I have not only those uh, students all around the world, but I have staff around the world, some who are presently stuck. I have a member of staff who's um, in lockdown in Saudi Arabia. And, and during the uh, working academic year, there is somebody from the nautical faculty in the air every single week. Well, thank you very much. And, and of course, the, the, those who graduate from, from the school uh, then find themselves on ships facing some of the challenges in some of the places that I wonder if we could just focus on uh, now for a bit, uh, Clive. I'm, I'm mindful of the South China Seas of other choke points and of the tensions which perhaps for the moment aren't so high because 
China is preoccupied with internal issues related to COVID-19. Could you talk a little bit about where, where the main choke points and areas of threat are that these uh, men and women sailing on these merchant ships um, uh, are likely to find themselves and, and what the Royal Navy and uh, its allies' capabilities are in that respect? Sure. Um, and I'd like to come back and talk, uh, build on um, Paul's point about um, coming out of the storm, because I think we do need to think differently there. But, but, but where are the strateg strategic challenges? Well, they're self-evident. You know, the key straits for supply are the Gibraltar Straits through sewers up into the uh, Gulf uh, uh, um, and, and uh, through the Gulf. I think the whole of that region is, is uh, one of higher threats than we would like. I think as you head further east, the Malacca Straits and through the Malacca Straits for a series of regions, um, in part because it is, uh, it is very busy, in part because it is contested, and in part there is too much piracy there uh, for um, safety, really. And then as we get into the sa South China Seas and Southeast Asia, um, you see a series of countries with competing, uh, competing ownership challenges um, and resource uh, issues that sit the whole way around the South China Sea's basin, whether you are the Philippines or Vietnam or Taiwan or China or whatever. And I think the challenge there is that there is one huge power in the form of China who, who is disregarding uh, global rules to, to exert its ownership, first of the, um, uh, the initial dotted island chain and then the outer island chain. And I think as flashpoints, that's probably as much of a flashpoint as anywhere. There is a principal thing, though, that almost worries me more, and that's the principle of freedom of navigation, Roddy. Um, we, the West, have, because of reorganisation of liberal societies and, and declining powers and all the rest of that, we've allowed certain sectors of our maritime space to become areas that we deploy into less regularly, both as commercial shipping, but also as, uh, as military shipping. And they're the High North, the Barents, uh, the Black Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, parts of the Gulf, uh, perhaps parts of um, uh, the West African coast and then further afield to the South China Seas. I think all of them have seen a trend of uh, a lack of permanent presence uh, and uh, which uh, has now been arrested, thank goodness. Um, and we are now pushing our way back into those to reinforce the principles of freedom of navigation. The challenge is here is if you have retired for a period, period, whether it is a strategic crouch or a pause, or you are preoccupied with Iraq and Afghanistan or whatever, uh, going back into these regions can be seen to be escalatory. And so um, while it is absolutely vital that everybody has freedom of navigation in all the seas, and, and that includes the Chinese and the Russians in our, in our seas as well, we have to understand it works both ways. They have to be done against a series of guidelines that mature maritime nations uh, uh, follow comfortably and not challenged either by terrorism or banditry or misbehaviour that we have seen both in the High North and in the South China Seas. So there is a maturity of behaviour that we are not seeing at the moment. Clive, sorry, I'd like to ask um, our, our director, uh, if he, Doug, if he would like to, to have any questions for you. I was particularly interested when you talked about the funding issues over the next 12 months and those being uh, important going forward. And I just wonder whether, given the other competing priorities, whether you think that defence spending might um, struggle to get the resources that perhaps it needs. Uh, sure. I mean, I think, I think um, governments have, and, and this is universal, almost globally governments have stepped forward with economic help packages that are uh, up, up until now would have been considered to be unbelievable and are far reaching and are exceptionally costly. So, so that we will need to consider how we recoup our economies uh, over the next 15 years, because this is going to be a long term payback. That will require a definition of a different set of priorities and that will require an allocation of resources that has a very long term view. If we do anything else, then I think we'll be foolhardy. 
you could argue uh, that in the short term, the sort of investment products the government needs to be making are those that are quick to spade or quick to build, to bring people into the workforce, to get the supply chain working and get them driving. And in the short term, shipbuilding and ship construction looks very attractive, like road building, like hospital building. The, cap the fast capital, capital to build projects, I think, are very important. Where where we need to think quite hard is do we invest in simplicity to get simple capability out and fast and this is as much in the ferry or the railroad or whatever industry as well as the military do we build uh, simple capability that we can roll out that keeps people employed that gets the supply chain working that gets the economy moving or do we has as a western trend has been for some time build increasingly bespoke expensive platforms that require a high degree of technological capability and global networking to deliver. And I would suggest that what we may see is a change of emphasis towards simplicity and towards numbers. Um, and, and if that's in the maritime military domain, then we are going to have to think about their fighting capability in terms of missile systems, radar systems and whatever, because if we're building a cheap hull, we need to have capability on it because we won't have ubiquity and resilience. I, I, if I can just finish, I think what we've then got to do, and I think this is really, really important, is think how we use this capability because government spend will tailor off. And therefore there is a, a real need at the moment to consider use and deployment. And I think that will drive a different form of alliance thinking because nations won't be able to do it all or won't be able to do it on their own. And I think how that groups, given the global frictions and the European frictions we've seen, may drive UK towards a global posture, but a regional focus. And I would suggest that regional focus becomes more North European Atlanticist than perhaps uh, a wider region, but I may be wrong. We're just, it's too, too early to tell the trends at the moment. Clive, also, uh, before we started our call, I talked to you, or we talked about um, the, the biological or germ warfare fighting capability of the Royal Navy and Western navies. And you told me how during ship construction, the compartmentalization of uh, what sits within the hull was designed in part to deal with that, but that much of that capability has gone. Um, do you think that needs to be restored? Um, I, I, think, I think it is important to understand that the capital procurement of a warship is shockingly large for any nation, whoever you are, whether you're Russia or whatever. And, and the West, and, and I suspect Russia, has taken the decision that in order to get holes out at cost, and they still seem formidably expensive, we will have to trade certain capability. And re the resilience part of it, which is its long-term strength, its hull form, its uh, whether or not you can compartmentalise for nuclear or biological or chemical warfare, has been traded out to a certain extent. Now, we're not going to suddenly replace our whole fleet of ships and the whole armour. So I think what will be interesting, Roddy, is where we invest to recover their capability and be able to continue fighting. And it might be that we have to re-engineer some very clever IPE or P, uh, either PPE for people so that they can fight in difficult conditions rather than condition the ship. So I don't quite know which way it will go. But certainly we have a duty of care to protect our sailors, as do commercial shipping lines have a duty of care to protect their sailors. And that's going to be a point of significant conversation into the future, I suspect. Could I ask you this question and then I'm going to kick this across to, uh, to Paul. Uh, we've talked about ships, we've talked about capital spend. Of course, it's those who sail within them that are so critically important. And it's, it's the manpower, the human capital element. Um, the, the need for leadership, the need for skills training, the need to constantly bring in young men and women uh, to be involved with, with the world of the sea, uh, well, above the sea and below it as well, uh, is critical. And in that respect, I suspect that places like the City of Glasgow College and universities are immensely challenged 
from a financial standpoint in the need to attract students, many of whom come from overseas, to keep their particular ship, ship going. So to you, Clive, I would ask the question just to comment upon the, the particular needs of young people who go to sea in ships, and then ask Paul if, Paul, if you could comment on the critical importance of attracting enough students to be able to, as it were, if you pardon the pun, stay afloat. So, Clive. So, so I'd like to go back one step, if you'll forgive me, to your question, because I think it's fundamental to what you've asked me. Yeah. I, think it, I think it is really important now and into the near future to get the narrative right, because our nations won't forgive us if we don't do things correctly. And, I, uh, and everywhere I read and everywhere I do analysis, it is trust, responsibility and, and confidence that people are buying at the moment in these very uncharted words. And, and customers, whether you are strategic customers buying security or, um, or, 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 or family customers buying kit, won't spend it if they don't believe in what they're buying. And I would warn that I think we are getting the maritime narrative wrong because we are trying to make it, uh, we are trying to stand out as unique uh, as a capability from the nation and from nations and in some ways special or different. I, I'm very struck by the filming technology where to sell a really big point in a story, you need to have something very domestic to allow people to understand it. And I think we need to go back to our messaging and message being part of our community and build the sequence out. And I think Paul's very, very good analogy of the First and Second World Wars, where everybody knew the bravery of the merchant na uh, navy and that they were keeping the country afloat, uh, that was firmly understood. I don't think that's well enough understood. And all of us have a part in that messaging. I think in terms of... Um, the investment in people we equally have got to understand that the young people are different and are much more discerning and require a different level of engagement and honesty and and as i've come out working in business uh, uh, and working with kids from 23 24 as part of a team um, who are contributing just as much as i am i am very very struck by our our inability to release talent certainly in in the NATO nations I saw, including our own. So I think what we've got to do is have a total reset of how we handle people. I think it's, it's, it's everywhere else has got to evolve. I think dealing with people has got to be a revolution. And we've got to give people more choice, uh, more technology, better living conditions, and operate them at a cycle that allows them to keep track of their own personal life in a way that I didn't as a young lieutenant, and I just deployed back to back to back and actually could put up with it. That is intolerable now. So, so I, and I suspect uh, that is the same for the Merchant Navy, but I think a revolution in people affairs will need to be taken on if we're going to use our ships better and get more influence in the globe. Thank you, Clive. Paul? Oh, that's a hugely challenging question. I think uh, Clive has been <laughs> very gallant in, in making an earnest attempt to answer that. I just have to add a few bits and pieces to that, particularly for the merchant side. I think, um, you know, we, we should stop talking about, you know, the post-COVID world uh, and start, you know, managing expectations and talking about the COVID world. Because I think this pandemic and subsequent pandemics are going to be with us. Um, so the whole concept of resilience, I think, takes a whole a new dimension going forward. And that's obviously going to feed in to uh, the training. And, and you know what? For hundreds and hundreds of years, we had resilience. We call that building character. I think uh, what we have to do now is to ensure that we build that character that fits the times that, that, that we're in and fit the times that are coming ahead for us. So in many ways... Um, leadership isn't going to change. The principles of leadership are there. I think we have to pivot, however, uh, away from uh, the leadership of me to the leadership of we. And I think increasingly, uh, certainly in the Merchant Navy, um, probably it's easier in the Merchant Navy than the Royal Navy or any 
other um, armed navies, is the concept of working uh, even more closely as a as a collective team, collaborating, collaborating with the shore, collaborating with the port, collaborating uh, even with other fleets going forwards. Um, so building in that concept of collaboration, I think it's going to be very, very important uh, in the future. I think um, the global trade is going to become increasingly a challenge. So, you know, raising cadets awareness about uh, the new commercial world is going to be very important and how that's going to be disrupted by autonomous shipping and AI and virtual reality um, as well. I think, you know, that's that supply chain you know, from a, an 18 year old cadet, you know, 10 years on until they become either a chief engineer or, or a ship's captain, certainly in the Merchant Navy. You know, that whole learning journey has to guide um, their development to to kind of build and keep that resilience, but also to prepare them for the digital world. So I think digital skills are going to become increasingly important in the future. And we shouldn't forget that, um, you know, that there'll be opportunity with all these crises. And, and for example, just at the minute, we are one of six colleges in the world which are preparing our young officers for polar navigation. So we're doing simulation technology to prepare uh, ships captains and, and chiefs uh, and third officers to uh, navigate in the um, you know the Northwest Passage, which was once impossible, or pretty impossible in many ways. Um, so as, as shipping companies start to use that to diversify, to maybe get back some of the economies, then obviously um, there's a whole range of new contexts that we have to prepare uh, the seafarers of the future. And I guess the bigger challenge is how long will they stay at sea? The average uh, time sea's gone down from a 30 year career to a 19 year career to presently it's 11 years at sea. So in many ways, we're trying to prepare for that transition of, of coming ashore potentially uh, and having the transferable skills coming coming ashore. So if it was only as simple, Roddy, as preparing the skills or Clive preparing the skills for being at sea, then you know we could certainly do that. But we're preparing uh, the seafarers for a digital world that's going to be disrupted beyond pandemics, uh, and we're preparing the seafarers the future in working in a commercial world, which I agree with Clive, uh, we're probably talking here a minimum of 10 years for any form of economic recovery. Um, and, and along with that will be um, unemployment within the maritime ministry and reskilling and upskilling associated with that as well. So we have certainly, as, as a maritime institute, got our work cut out for us in terms of how can we reduce the time it takes to skill how can we keep the skilling as flexible as possible? And how can we prepare our seafarers for the Zuki world, you know, the volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous? And if you ever want a definition of that, then welcome to the COVID world. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, Doug, as we are reaching the end of this session, I think, time-wise, was there anything else you'd like to add before I ask Clive if he could sort of sum up as well? Well, I think perhaps we should just give Clive the opportunity if he wanted to say anything more about the communication point that he uh, he raised earlier. Right, Clive. Um, I, th I think I, I, I um, I'm not sure it's quite the uh, communication point, but I think there's a couple of things. I think we, uh, if if as we start to build a communication path and get it right, there's. Uh, and I couldn't agree more with what um, uh, has been said. I think there's there's a need to build a narrative. It needs to be linked to relevance and it needs to be talk, linked to resources as never before. Uh, and, and I think it's no good saying to the country or saying to the world, it's a complex world, it's all terribly difficult. It's building scenarios that we can then explain to people why the Merchant Navy and why the Royal Navy and why, why careers inside it are so important. And we need to contain in that not only doom and gloom and economic, economic stuff, but exciting stuff about technology and where it's going. So, so I, think, I think it's stringing that together. And I was very struck. I, I read through recently the Chilcot report. I didn't read through it all, but I read through this executive summary. And, and Chilcot clearly was talking about the Iraq war and it was guidance to the Ministry of Defence, but he said four things that I thought um, 
are really pertinent to a business process now. He said, we fail to understand the ground before we set off. So in a, we are in a COVID world for the next 20 years, best we understand it. We, we fail to apply critical thinking and cross-cutting thinking, which is why I think this institute is so important to challenge groupthink so that we do expose things. We, we fail to apply foresight in his words, but so what test in mine of so what's going to happen if and have a plan B and a plan C and a plan D, because that then makes us agile. And I think the the career length of sailors is an exact in a, an exact exa an example of where the the reality is changing. So best we have a plan B or a plan C. And the final thing that um, Chilcott says is he says we completely failed to explain to the country and the world why we were doing this. So the self belief and the belief systems weren't ingrained anywhere, even as it turns out into the hierarchy who were questioning more senior orders because they weren't quite settled on where we were sitting. So, so I think if, as we build out of here for the maritime world, it's almost heeding what Chilcott said and going through the steps, but doing it together. I think very quickly, we've got to avoid being the maritime Navy and the military Navy, but be one maritime force working for good. Clive, thank you very much indeed. And I'd also now at this point like to thank Paul Little, principal of uh, Glasgow City College um, and the United Kingdom's leading maritime school, if we can call it that, turning out great merchant Navy uh, sailors. Uh, I'd like to thank Doug Cook for having arranged this call. And, and Clive, I'd like to thank you very much above all else, former senior NATO Naval commander, now um, stirring the waves with strategic advice to a number of different companies uh, and individuals and very kindly thank you due to at some point when movement is returned to visit Glasgow and Paul's great establishment. So to all of you, thank you for being on this call on behalf of the Asia Scotland Institute and please stay in touch and watch our future discussions. Tomorrow's is on India, as I recall. So thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.